Hi, thanks for joining us on American Perspective with Patriot Mom 007. Today I'm here with Elijah Norton. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. So Elijah, I've seen him around town. He's running for U.S. Congress and he is in my district. So I'm glad I got a chance to meet you finally because you are so busy and we're at three weeks left before our primary on August 2nd. So you're even busier. So yeah. thank you again, like bottom of my heart. Thank you because we don't know each other and he made time for me. So the appreciation is, is really true. Thank you very much. I, I really think it's important that if I'm running for office and if I get elected that I'm there to meet with my constituents. and, and talk to the people that's, and that's I yeah. think something that we're lacking right now and that's what we want to see I mean all our new candidates and the ones I am um, in favor of, of seeing win um, they are all real people they're around town they have people to their homes personally and I know that you are making a, a real big concerted effort to get out there and I see you everywhere so I know you are doing it um, anybody who says that you're not is not out there clearly so I do really just want to start um, since we don't know each other I don't really know a lot about you I mean I, I have my little notes here born and raised in the Midwest which part of the Midwest by the way Kansas City Kansas City I do not hear that very often in Arizona I know I mean I, not a lot of Kansans out here so uh, how long have you been in Arizona so I moved here in 2015 uh, okay. and the story of me moving here is actually kind of interesting I almost got in a plane crash um, I was traveling from Kansas City to Orange County on business I think it was 2013 or 14 and then I was going back from Orange County to Kansas City and the connection point was Phoenix and so the flight from Orange County to Phoenix was probably one of the worst flights I've ever been on. I've been on maybe over a hundred flights and uh, this was bad. I mean there were people crying, screaming, praying. Right. We thought the plane was going to go down. We encountered severe turbulence and then we got around Phoenix. The plane dropped like a thousand feet in like two oh seconds gosh. or five seconds or whatever it was. Uh, I'm not an aeronautical engineer but, uh, but it, it, was, it was a very scary flight. Yeah. And uh, I was in the back, and I can just remember uh, the woman next to me praying and someone crying. I mean, it was it was it was bad. And so when we got to Phoenix, they put us in a holding pattern. And the plane just kind of circled around uh, Sky Harbor uh, for about an hour, not knowing when or if we were going to land. Uh, thank God we landed, and uh, uh, I I couldn't get on the next flight because there was a snowstorm in Kansas City. So I didn't want to have to go through the same thing right. again. So I had always heard good things about Phoenix, and uh, I stayed the night in Scottsdale, and I was kind of intrigued. It was a really cool area. There's a yeah, downtown Scottsdale. There's a lot going on. And uh, one of my business partners and his wife, uh, uh, they went to ASU and he was living in California at the time in Orange County. And um, he uh, encouraged me to, him and her to go out uh, for a weekend and kind of explore it. And yeah. we went out for a weekend and Loved I, it. I fell in love with it immediately. Yeah. It's and a great, great state, great town for sure. I've been here 24 years almost myself from Oregon, grew up in uh, Oregon. So big change for me, but I love it and will never leave. I mean, I don't think they could pay me to leave, although unless they do something dramatic and we don't get good people in office, that might be a catalyst for some people leaving eventually. So hopefully that won't happen. Uh, I want to ask you, because I read your great-grandfather, Elijah Heiss Norton. You're named after him. Yes. Tell me about him. So he was a congressman in 1861. Uh, he was actually a judge in Missouri, a well-respected judge. And uh, that was during the Civil War. And when the country was, was breaking apart, uh, he was actually a unionist. He was not a secessionist. And Missouri was, was debating whether to leave the union or stay in the union. And many historians say that if Missouri had left, uh, the South would have, would have potentially won the war because Missouri had St. Louis, which was one of the largest cities at the time, and they had the river, and uh, it was a very important strategic point in the Civil War. Uh, but he was a delegate to the Missouri Convention on Secession, and he act actively spoke out against Missouri leaving, and he was one of the primary people that helped uh, the decision come about of Missouri staying in the Union. And so wow. uh, then he was subsequently elected to Congress for a term, uh, and it's kind of uh, interesting to think of what was going on then. The Capitol was being expanded. Wow, that's President amazing. Lincoln was the president. Oh my gosh. Uh, and that is pretty yeah. uh, interesting historical facts about your family. So you, your family, then I, I'll just make the leap, um, is invested in the country yes. in general and um, maybe where you settle, maybe back there, Kansas, but, but wherever you settle, I would suspect that you have a pretty big stake just from that perspective and what's happening in your area. And now that you've settled here, um, what made you decide to jump in? Well, you know, it, I got really involved in 2020. So I donated to uh, try to defeat Proposition 208 
Uh, I, uh, I also got the privilege because I moved my business here from Kansas City, as I said, uh, to go around to different places. Uh, I was on the radio a couple times. I was on, I spoke to a bunch of Republican and conservative groups about how bad Proposition 208 would have been. I mean, it would have just killed jobs. Thank right. God. Uh, unfortunately, it passed but at the ballot box, but uh, luckily our Supreme Court ruled that it was unconstitutional. And so um, that was kind of my foray into politics. But I, uh, in addition to Proposition 208, I also got the chance to meet a bunch of state legislative, congressional candidates, Senate candidates, uh, federal and state. I, I, I really got involved in the 2020 election cycle. I donated to President Trump. I donated to the Republican Party. I donated all the different, uh, pretty much every single competitive state legislative race. Only Republicans never get into a Democrat. Right. And I would sit down with these different people and I would meet with them and I would, I would ask questions one on one before I'd give them a check. And I got to know them for about an hour, kind of like we're doing now. And I was really appalled. Um, there are some really good ones. Right. Um, you know, I had lunch with Paul Gosar. I've, I've, uh, I've had some. I've, there's been some really good congressmen and, and state legislators that I've interacted with. But there are some other ones that I'm sitting here and I'm thinking, I wouldn't hire you to be my secretary. Uh, I wouldn't hire you to do anything in right. my business. You have no business representing 150,000 or 200,000 people if you're running for a legislative seat, yeah. or 750,000 people right. if you're running for a congressional seat, or even I've, I've even talked to senators over the phone in other states that I donated to, because um, you know, I want to be a good Republican and help out. And I was shocked that they were a senator. And so uh, I think when I take a step back and I look at all the different people in Congress right now, the majority of them, I, I implore anyone look, walk, you know, watching this right now to go Google just 10 members of Congress and see what their background is. And I guarantee you that 70 to 80% of them will have started out in the state legislature. They'll have worked their way up to the county board of supervisors or maybe the city council. Then they'll go to Congress. It's this career path. Right. And if you look at my opponent, David Schweikert, for example, he's been a politician for 30 years. Right. Uh, never really had a job outside of that. And that's not what our founders intended. Our founders intended for the best people in our society to step up, uh, who, who want to give back to their communities, serve for a limited period of time, and get out, which is also a reason I'm very much in favor of term limits. Um, because I think that this, is, this, this, this culture of the career politician uh, needs, to go away. needs to go away. And the number one person, I think, that really ended that is President Trump. Uh, he ran for the highest office in the land and right. won. And so I think that that has inspired business people and, and other people that have never been in office before to start running for other different offices around the country. And it really gives me a lot of hope because these politicians have ruined our country. That's uh, true. And we need business people and leaders and, and to, to save us. And I think we're getting there. So let's talk a little bit about your business. So sure. I, I know you own a business and I've read about it. So tell us, what is your business? So I own a company called Veritas Global. It's a F and I insurance company, so we insure and administer claims for service contracts, which are commonly called warranties, okay. um, gap policies. Oh, you work with dealerships? Yes, okay. and banks and financial institutions. Uh, my opponent, unfortunately, has uh, said that my company does robocalls, and which is a lie. We've actually sent him two cease and desist letters. He ignored them, and on Monday, uh, my company filed a lawsuit against him and his slimy consultant for these continued lies. Uh, because it's one thing to lie about me. Unfortunately, in politics, you can say whatever you want about right. your opponent. Right. Um, but you can't lie about a business. Uh, and when you lie about my company, where I have 100 employees that depend on my business for a livelihood uh, and depend on our company's reputation, I'm not going to put up with that. Uh, and our, my business isn't going to put up with that. And my employees aren't going to put up with that. And so that's right. where we filed that lawsuit. And um, if I could ask, so now that you live here, um, have you moved your, your headquarters with your employees here? Are they still oh, yes. op they, they operate so, here? So when I first moved here in 2015, the plan, the business was much smaller then. And the plan was to open up a second office. And um, I had looked at multiple states. I had thought about potentially Colorado, Texas, Florida. And then when I had that plane crash incident, Arizona was on my list. Uh, Colorado is blue. It was, at that point, purple but leaning blue. It's worse blue, now. And it's gotten a lot, it's worse. a lot worse. High regulation, high tax environment. Um, so like I said crazy no. Crazy people. And it's cold. I didn't, you know. And I, it's cold. Yeah, it is. And uh, it's beautiful. If you're a skier, it's great. I love skiing, but but not uh, uh, not as much as that. Yeah. Just to go up to the mountain for the weekend. I go to Flagstaff here. Exactly. For, for two hours. It's perfect. Um, so, Colorado was out. Texas, great political climate, but um, I there's nothing. I mean, there's no mountains. There's no. Uh, it's, it's not a very yeah. pretty terrain like like Arizona is. Right. 
And I also looked at Florida, which obviously has the beaches and everything, but I don't like the humidity. So, right. <laughs> right. Uh, I looked at Arizona. I, I loved Phoenix. I loved our climate. I loved the dry weather. I, I, you know, I could deal with hot. Like I know it's like 110 it's only, outside, but it's only a few weeks. I don't care. I, I can deal with it. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, the, 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 it's just such a beautiful state. I mean, we have. In the north, we have mountains and snow-capped mountains and, and, and just beautiful scenery. Here we have beautiful scenery. It's, it's a great place to live. Very pro-business climate, and we've got to keep it that way. Right. Uh, low regulations, low taxes. Um, it's the perfect place to start a business. So actually, when I moved my business here in 2015, shortly thereafter, uh, I, I or opened up my second office, I re-domiciled my business here. And as the company grew, I had more jobs in the Phoenix office and less jobs in the Kansas City office. And now we have a small group of people in Kansas City, but 95% sure. of my employees are here in Phoenix. And are you ex planning to expand? I know with your political aspirations, and, and if you were to make it to office, you're going to be busier than you are now. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I'm sure you have good people helping you run. Is that your is your intention to grow in Arizona and bring? More oh yeah, I mean, to, yeah. Uh, so I've been very blessed. Um, in and, really, and let me just stop you before you go on. I just to, just to add in, you started this business when you were very young, 21 years old. Yes, and I started a business when I was well 26. It was a salon business at that time. I took over and changed it and made it a seven day a week business. Um, so, and I was 26. So 21, like I know what I was doing when I was 21. It was not business. Yeah. Um, so when you're telling me about this too, just incorporate too. I just want to hear because uh, we we'll have a lot of. So we're on YouTube for now. Um, There'll be a, young people watch YouTube. Like, I'm older, so I just started using YouTube six months ago. But anyway, um, so when I, my goal is like, let people know, like I'm real big on, I have a small business, schooling is important, I have two kids. So tell me about too, when you were young, how you found the drive, the motivation, and how you got to where that became yeah. your business. So I was in school, and uh, I, I originally had teamed up with another person. We started out as, as an agency, and then we expanded to where we actually became our own administrator and insurer. Um, but it was difficult at first. I mean, uh, my, my uncle, who owned a plumbing company, told me that uh, it would take me about three to five years before I'd really right. see any type of substantial profits. Right. And he was right, uh, literally pretty much to the year. Um, it, you know, the first two years were struggles. I mean, we, it was difficult to make payroll. It was difficult to, um, to navigate. I will say one thing that really was a challenge was bureaucracy and dealing with regulators. Uh, if you want to realize why someone becomes a, a conservative really fast, um, from own a financial business. standpoint, try to start a business. A business. Yeah. yeah, and it's I, it, for me. It, I can I'm kind of fascinated how some people, you know, can be a, a, in the left when you are having to deal with all the regulations that that a lot of business owners do in the tax code and right. and all this. So um, it was very difficult the first three years, but then after three years, something just happened. I was very pers perseverance, and uh, the business started to become profitable, and then it just kind of grew and ballooned and evolved from there. Uh, today. In 2019, I hired a new CEO. Okay. Um, he the the goal was for him to, to grow the domestic business, and I was going to grow the international Which business. Which I see. I know. I actually uh, read Canada, Chile, and Europe. Yep. You're all doing business overseas we as well. Yes. So how is that business these days? I mean, your business is not r relatable to the the co I mean, sales and dealerships. Yes, but they didn't really go offline either. Dealerships were still right. Toyota was still pumping out cars. Oh yeah, during and, COVID. And COVID. At so. first, so the first month. It went. It was bad. Sales went down a half, then seventy five percent, and then they started to kind of go back up. So uh, we didn't. We were very uncertain for about three months, but after that, we were we were doing good again. Um, and so I really think that um, that you know we learned a lot through COVID, but also you know the CEO was really uh, he really started to get the hang of things, and so. Um, the plan was again to, for me to expand the international business, but then COVID happened, so I couldn't right. really do that. We still we do some international business, but right now the majority of our business is here in the U.S. Although we are growing, right? Um, and so, but my CEO now has a point and a handle on the business where he runs it day to day. I spend about two to five hours okay. a so week good talking to him, and the company's growing. I mean, revenues are growing, profits are growing, um, and and at a pretty exponential rate. Even though I'm not there day to day, and I think that oh, I hope that's kind of a testament to my leadership that do. I was able to implement that type of infrastructure. Uh, to where even though I'm out, somebody can run it day to day. Step away and yeah, it still yeah. runs smoothly. And then now that you moved here, then your family, they were in Kansas, I'm sure, are they still there? Did some of them move out here? You have siblings? No, all my family and siblings are still back in, well, I have one sibling in LA. Okay. Who's a lawyer. And then okay. I have another, uh, my other brother is in um, 
uh, Kansas City. My the rest of my family is in Kansas City. Do they come out and visit? <laughs> yes, they do. Do they like it so they far do. when they see it? Okay. Yes. Well, you know, families has a tendency. I know a lot of people move here, and then soon enough, all their friends and family live here too. So there's probably just a hop, skip, and a jump for that to happen down the road. You never know. Never know. Um, so um, let's talk a little bit now um, about the campaign. Tell me. Um, we're ramping up in the last three weeks for August 2nd. So tell me kind of where you're at um, as far as getting your message out, your, the receptivity of people that you've come in contact with in our district, and just how that's going. You know, <clears throat> I've been very optimistic uh, this whole time, but I've, I've really started to see about three to four months ago a shift. Uh, there's this belief that because I'm running against an incumbent that it's not possible, but people are now starting to see it's possible. Uh, people are now starting, you know, I, I've, I've talked to people all the time. I was in a, in a legislative district meeting yesterday. Uh, I, I do events I every day. I missed that meeting. Oh. I was at a different event. I know. I was LD3. like, oh, darn it, I heard that was a good meeting. Yeah, and I, I do family town halls, and I'm going through the district, and what I'm recognizing is people do not feel like they're adequately represented by the congressman that we currently have. Uh, in addition to the fact that he's a crook and he's stolen money and he's committed fraud, uh, which in my opinion alone disqualifies someone from holding any public office, um, I think people are just saying, I'm not, I don't feel like I have a representative. I don't feel like there's someone there that I can contact, that if I contact his office, there's not getting any calls back. It's He's become lazy. Now, he's that's changed since I, I think this candidacy has advanced, but uh, I'm sensing a shift in the thing, that the, in the overall dynamics of the district that people are ready for a change. Right. Uh, they're ready for someone to really go to D.C. who's going to be a more conservative voice in Congress, who's going to uh, represent them better with ethics and integrity, and who's going to do it for the right reasons. I think that's another key thing. Uh, right now, I think he's doing it for the wrong reasons. He's doing it to enrich himself. He's been found guilty now twice by Congress and by the FEC. And so... Um, now, just a real quick point on that. So, I'm new to politics. Um, there's a lot to sift sure. through, right? Some things have been going on for a while. My understanding, and this is secondhand information somebody told me about his uh, the issues that uh, Mr. Schreckert had legally, that something about the statute had run out or there was no con actual convictions. Like, I, I, I'm not... So yeah, I'll go into all the details. I I know all the. You probably I know, know if you're yeah. in the lawsuit right now. I'm sure you have. Well, yeah. the lawsuit is that our lawsuit is actually separate from his pre 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 previous uh, issues. But what basically happened is between 2010 and 2018, Schweikert did a series of very very egregious uh, things. Uh, in 2012, he committed bank fraud. He lied on a, a loan application, said that he had a $100,000 loan that he he made a fake loan on his FEC reports, lied on a bank loan application saying that he had $100,000 in assets that he didn't have, and the bank gave him $75,000 that he then used to send out dirty mail pieces about his opponent. Um, and, uh, but there was no conviction, though. Well, so the problem, he, was, he wasn't point. convicted by the, uh, by the federal government for a criminal offense uh, in, in regards to I bank just don't, I just say yeah. that, make the point, because a conviction is a pretty uh, serious sure. movement in court, and so if there's no, I just want to make it clear, like, I, because I don't peddle in gossip. And, and since I don't know, I just am clarifying. Well, I think conviction can be taken. In, so he was convicted, if you would, by Congress. At 434 Congress, okay. of his peers in Congress, every Republican and every Democrat, he, he abstained, yet was found him, found him guilty and reprimanded him on the floor of the House. He's actually one of only five people in the history of the United States that's happened to. And he was guilty of, of 11 violations. Number one was bank fraud. And bank fraud is actually a criminal offense. It's a felony under 13, Section 1344 of the United States Criminal Code. Now, he was never, unfortunately, I think he should have been indicted and taken to jail for that because I mean I don't know anyone uh, in my business career who has committed bank fraud uh, but but um, he also that delayed the investigation I think that's why that didn't happen he spent over 1.2 million dollars of his donors money on legal bills paid it out of the campaign I actually was one of his victims I gave him a check in 2020 for two thousand eight hundred dollars oh, you donated to I him. did and I gave him that money to try to defeat Halal Tripperini and instead he used it to pay legal bills and I didn't know about the ethics issues back then I was I had knew, known about it as kind of very nebulous um, I didn't know what the, the depth of them was. When I sat down and I met with him, he blamed his chief of staff for it. And uh, I sympathize because I've had employees who've done right. things that, that... Things that, happen, you don't always yeah. know. But 
at the end of the day, when you start to look at the facts, and I encourage everyone here to go to the SchweikertReport.com. It's a website that we created. You can download all the documents, all the federal, uh, everything. So when you say created, you mean you created a site, but on the site, there's no creation. It's all actual yes, legal documents correct. that you've just downloaded. Correct. It's, a, it's, okay. a, it's an easy way for viewers to go in and look at the facts. Because you know, as we all know, in politics, you can say everything, but I, I can back everything I've set up. There's about 3,000 pages. There's a 13 page, 12 or 13 page ethics report, and there are 3,000 pages of what are called statements of alleged violations or SAVs. But in the SAVs, you can see uh, the bank application that shows that he committed bank fraud. You can see bank statements of, of transactions that he had. You can see emails back and forth between his staff basically saying that he told them to do this or told them to do that. So when he tells people that it was his staff's fault, that is a lie. Uh, in fact, his former treasurer, Karen Garrett, who was there when he committed bank fraud and some of the other egregious ethics violations, recently uh, went on television. We paid her nothing. She did this for free uh, and talked about some of the things that he did. Uh, and so um, the evidence there is is pretty uh, severe and, 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 and damaging. And so it, it's just really, really sad. I mean, he committed money laundering. He stole, we think he stole half a million dollars out of his campaign, if you look at all the... Uh, but, but I will just caveat, say nothing's... There are no convictions around these things. Not that they didn't happen, and I'm, I'm not suggesting they didn't happen. I'm just saying, from a legal standpoint, when people hear things, I, I do want to just make the point that um, you need to do your research, yep. is the point. And if you're voting um, in August 2nd or in November or next year in the future, you just need to know who you're voting for. Not that what Elijah is sharing with us is true or untrue. I haven't looked at it, at any of it. So I'm just going to say, just be informed, educate yourself, and um, then you can be <clears throat> able to better make a decision when you do vote. And and as far as lawsuits go, so I do want to really sure. focus on you. you. Of course. Um, I mean, I'd love to talk to Mr. Schweikert. I don't know him, but maybe he'll give me some time. But um, you actually have there's some some negative things about you and I and I would like you to address some of them sure. you, I mean we can't address all of them there's a lot of negativity out there but you know they did say some things about your business I have read um, and, and I don't know who's saying it they just say they these people like there's no names um, I know there's a, a new lawsuit I heard um, from your team that was filed a couple days ago not by you but by the the unnamed person who is was brought into the negative campaign ads yep. about you. So w let's talk about the, sure. the company first and what they're saying uh, about you as an owner, running employees. There's there's two things that he's alleging in, in, in the things he says about my businesses. Number one, he says that my company makes robocalls. We don't make robocalls. We have sent him two cease and desist letters and he ignored both of them. And now he's now he's paying the price, he's being sued. And I think there's a high chance, a very high chance of success in the litigation because we don't do it. We can prove we don't do it. He can come into our office and see all of my salespeople have cell phones and they're calling on agents or dealers. They're not calling on, or banks, they're not calling on, or financial companies, they're not calling people with a robocaller. Don't, right. We don't have that, we don't even have the software to initiate So you're a direct to dealer. We're direct to business. We do bi dealers, so banks, you, yeah, financial institutions. You're not marketing to no. Susie We market Jones. to businesses yeah. and then those businesses hire us to administer their claims and to ensure the policies that they write. Uh, David Schweikert knows this. We've sent him two cease and desist letters. We sent him one a year ago when I first announced uh, that I was going to form an exploratory committee. And then we sent him another cease and desist letter when he put up this website. And he actually changed the website to take my company's name off of it because he knew that he had some legal issues there. Okay. But then he sends out these mailers that directly reference my company. And so that's when we said that's enough is enough. Uh, the president of the company, I'm, that business uh, there's a, the, said, you know what, we're suing. This is it. We're done. And, and, and I think he needs to be held accountable for this because you can't lie about someone's company. That's, that's someone's right. livelihood. Those are, there's people well, that depend people on Well, people are that. working. Yeah, other they people depend. are working and, there. And it's his constituent, by the way. We're in his district, and those people are in his district. And for their own congressman, uh, for, for our, our own congressman to make up lies about uh, the business and the employees that work in the business is just, in my opinion, disgusting. That's one thing he says. Another thing he says is that uh, we've been sued. Okay, when you're in an insurance company and we've written over right. 500. Everybody's been sued. Yeah, well, but, but we, I mean, we've written over 500,000 policies. We do, do over $100 million a year in revenue. We paid over $75 million in claims. Right. Uh, when you have that much business, 
you get sued. There's sometimes com customers right. aren't happy uh, with a with a it specific happens, yeah. policy, yep. and uh, they might sue us. And, and we try to we have a you know we have good we have a pretty good rating. We have a, I think a very good rating for our type of business on the Better Business Bureau and on okay. the Google reviews. Um, but I can't make every customer happy at that size and that volume. No, and we do our best. But 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 there's going to be some disgruntled customers. So he uses that. Uh, he also references an eight million dollar lawsuit that was filed against one of my businesses. Um, by this guy named Andrew Quiet. Uh, this guy is a was temporarily disbarred. He was uh, in fact got in trouble in Texas for buying faxes from Chase in the 90s and suing them. I mean, this guy is a, and he's vice chair of the Democratic Party or former vice chair of the okay. Democratic Party. Interestingly enough, and so he's pulling these grasping at straws and pulling these bogus things to try to paint this picture that's just not real. And so about my business, I mean, it, we do business with some of the largest dealer groups on the planet. Uh, we have uh, a very good reputation. People know who we are. Uh, it, and so for him to say that we're a scam is just ludicrous. And, uh, and now he's going to have to answer to a court for that. And the second suit that I brought up is not against you or filed by you, um, but a, an unnamed person, I don't know who they are. Um, brought it against Mr. Schweiker, it is my understanding, sure. for being, um, I guess, slandered, I guess the word would be, I don't know if that's legally the term that is used in the suit, um, for bringing him into the negative campaigning ad. And so, t can you, what can you tell us about uh, that without... We're not, we're not the one that filed that suit, obviously. Right. But, but what I can tell you is, uh, this gets into the absolute worst of the worst as far as campaigning is. Every time David Schweiker runs against a young guy for election, he accuses he always go he always makes up nonsense uh, and, and talks about their sexuality. So you know there's a picture out there, right? Yeah, oh, I'm very much aware. Yes. Okay. So like I've I have pictures I probably don't want published when I was, you know, in my 20s. Not that I was doing anything illegal, but like you're in your 20s, you know, you're out, you're 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 maybe out with friends or whatever. You don't always look your best. Well, here, here's and what here's so what So what's the can you can you talk about the picture? Yeah. And, and so the picture yeah. was, I was, a girl invited me to a bar with one of her best friends who happened to be gay, and I'm friends with the guy. Uh, I don't care if someone's gay. I don't. Of course. Uh, my generation doesn't. I think people have, have evolved on that issue. Uh, and so I took a picture with someone who uh, I think Schweikert was trying to imply that I was in a gay relationship with a person. Which I is, feel like that's what the Which is not was. true and false. Not that we, I mean, you... Well, <laughs> not that we would care. I uh, mean, it's not. It really should be a non-issue to even like identify it, people like that. It should be. And 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 here's where, where what really makes me angry about this. So number one, that person did not ask to be in, involved in this. And right. from what I understand, he sent Schweiker to cease and desist letter. And the next day, or shortly thereafter, he sends out fifty thousand mail pieces. Um, this person has been it suffered emotional distress because sure. of this, and it's not fair. And by the way. It, 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 it hurts the Republican Party. I have to deal with millennials all day that are in my age group that say you're a racist and you're, you're, Republicans are homophobes and right. we're not. And, and for a 12 year member of Congress to send out a mail piece, and by the way it says Elijah Norton isn't being straight with you, to send that filth out to 50,000 or 100,000, whatever the number is people, is disgraceful, despicable, and I think alone should disqualify him from ever holding office ever again. And, and in addition to that, uh, this is not the first time he's done this. In 2012, he sent out a mail piece that said, Ben Quayle goes both ways, accusing Ben Quayle, his primary opponent in 2012, also I think was my age, I think he was 31 or 32, accusing him of being bisexual. And you know, it's it's wrong and it's not right. And, and it, you, someone's, number one, someone's sexuality shouldn't be brought into a political right. race. But number two, uh, it's, it's false. I mean, it's, it, it, he's lied about Quayle. Quayle was married and had two kids. He's making up lies about me. It just, it's not uh, many lies about me. It, it, it has no place in modern political discourse, and it's just really despicable. And I, I really hope uh, that he learns a lesson, I mean, from this, because it's not right, uh, and I don't think anyone thinks it's right. And it's been very encouraging to see the reaction of people that have just said this is, this is I, I've, I've met people that said, I was gonna vote for David, um, but uh, after that mail piece, I'm not. And uh, it just shows that, that the level of disgust that people have, and I, I think that, and so I, I, I support uh, this lawsuit. I hope that, that he prevails, and and um, and I hope that David learns a lesson.